Hi everyone, I am back. Um, it's taken me a year and a half to make this video and I'm really sorry guys. Um, what can I say, some pretty crazy stuff happened. Um, we did up a house, we moved. All at the same time my youngest child was becoming mobile so I kind of just needed to take a break and focus on my family for a while. Um, but I just felt like I've had so much to say and I've been so desperate to remain part of this conversation. And I am so grateful to every single person who is subscribed to me and I don't want any of you who are subscribed or who are watching to think that I take any of you for granted at all. And one thing that I can honestly say is that I have thought about making this video and coming back to YouTube every single day for the past year and a half and I've been feeling bad that I promised you all a video about witch hunts, which did not materialise for so long, but here it is. Um, okay, so why do I feel that I want to make a video about witch hunts and why have I spent so long trying to make sure that I get it right? Um, of course, it's a phrase that gets used a lot these days. Both sides of our divided society view themselves as the victims of witch hunts. However, um, the first time I decided I really needed to make a video on this topic was after Donald Trump said that he was the victim of a witch hunt. Um, and many feminists and voices on the left responded by saying, no, witch hunts were all about strong and intelligent women being destroyed by the patriarchy. Um, and because I have taught the crucible about the Miller many times, um, I had to make sure that, as well as knowing all the stuff about McCarthyism, um, that I also knew the historical context um, of the Salem Witch Trials that Arthur Miller was working with. Um, so I know that this whole idea of um, these intelligent, healing women uh, being persecuted is just not what was going on. And we do know that for a fact because the Salem Witch Trials, as, as with many of the other witch trials that took place across Europe, are very well documented and it is actually possible to get quite a good idea of what was going on by looking at all the documents um, that we have and a lot of people have done a lot of work uh, on, on those sources. Um, and I can tell you that the reality was very very far from the stereotype that many people have in their minds. Um, I first read this book on the subject um, many years ago, uh, many years before the ugly beast of modern identity politics reared its head. Um, it's called A Delusion of Satan by Frances Hill. And no matter how many times I go back to it, I am just always riveted. I just read it like this. I cannot put it down. I would advise everyone to read it. It is highly acclaimed. Um, and if you're interested in any of the issues I'm going to speak about, please just read it because obviously don't take my word for anything I'm about to say, do the reading for yourself. So the first false impression I was intending to correct is that there were actual witches somehow practicing feminine wisdom and who had some kind of special power that the patriarchy didn't like and was trying to destroy. And that's just plain wrong. But then as I kept reading, I realised there was so much more than that in what was going on here that really can be compared to some of what's going on today. And obviously it is not a perfect comparison. But this is really about what happens when enough people within a society become ideologically possessed. Okay, everybody, repeat after me. There were no witches. In a way, this is the most important point to make and to take away from this video, but it's also kind of the least interesting as well because it's just a fact. Um, so I'm just going to have to do a really quick summary of the witch hunts that happened in Europe and North America during the early modern period. This is an enormous topic, so again, please don't just take my word for any of it. Go and look up the facts for yourself. These witch hunts started in around the 13th century, but they peaked in around the 16th and 17th centuries during a time when there were huge changes in religious doctrine in Europe. A lot of people were also being imprisoned and executed for heresy at the same time, which is also an important thing to remember about the context. Um, we need to be aware of that. Um, interestingly, though, what we don't tend to see is Protestants accusing Catholics and Catholics accusing Protestants. It seems to be more like a general insecurity about belief that was exploding sporadically in different places. 
Um, perhaps everyone just had so much invested in being right about things that humans, I mean, are never really going to have the answer to, a bit like today. Um, you know, when you think about these people who are so obsessed with um, what's the right way to bring up a child, is gender a social construct? Um, I guess it's going to be a balance between, a mixture between nature and nurture, but maybe, you know, we're never going to have the answers. Um, and we're also never going to have the answer about, you know, the human condition, what's going to happen when we die. And I guess um, maybe that's why our society today is so kind of fraught and worried about finding something to latch on to about how to live a good life and be a good person. Um, anyway, back to the witch hunt. One thing that seems pretty clear about the whole thing is that there pretty much were no witches. Um, yes, there was superstitious behaviour, there may have been people trying to heal illness with, you know, saints amulets and stuff like that, but there were no witches covens, there were no sabbaths or anything like that. Um, and the fact that many modern narratives seek to portray the witch hunts as a patriarchal hunting down of female intuitive magic is particularly gross in the case of the Salem witch trials, which we're talking about, because this was a community that was deeply, deeply Christian. And in fact, many of those who were hanged died because they refused to make false confessions and they clung to their deeply held Christian beliefs. And as we'll see when I talk about some of the individuals, it was actually those with the deepest Christian faith who had the strength to die in defiance of of the evil and the lies. And I do believe that if those individuals were here today, they would be deeply offended at the idea of being portrayed or revered as witches in any way. And yet, feminists are doing this. Salem, Massachusetts, a place known for trying and executing accused witches, is now affectionately called Witch City. And it seems that a growing number of young women and some men are being drawn to a brand of witchcraft. And it's political. I use the term witch to describe myself. I usually cite the acronym woman in total control of herself. I am the owner of House Witch Home and Healing in Salem, Massachusetts. I practice witchcraft. I pull tarot cards. I have crystals everywhere. I make shrines. I cast spells. I meditate. But it's sort of a political distinction and I think it like speaks to my radical feminism. I highly recommend everybody watches the whole of this video. I will put a link down below. It's called The Modern Witch of Salem, Feminist, Empowered and Anti-Trump. And it really has to be watched to be believed. God bless them. I fully support uh, them if they want to be witches. That's absolutely fantastic. But they sort of swan around Salem thinking it has something to do with what happened there all that time ago. And it really, really just doesn't, all of this occult stuff. Nobody associated uh, the, the medieval witch trials with the occult until sort of the 1800s when Gothic literature was becoming fashionable. And then in the 20s and the 30s, when occultism became very mainstream, these ideas really took hold. Um, probably the most influential person in this process was Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who was an American feminist who published a book called Woman, Church and State in 1893. She argued that women had been like priestesses who had transmitted all this pre-Christian wisdom and power from a matriarchal past and the witch trials were all about the patriarchy stamping that out. However, like the reformed SJW academic Christopher Dummett, who recently wrote an article for Quillette, basically she just made it all up. Um, the facts speak so loudly against this interpretation that, you know, there are even feminist academics out there arguing that people just need to stop perpe perpetuating this falsehood. Um, unfortunately, thanks to the movie The Da Vinci Code, that's pretty much all that's in your average person's mind nowadays when they think about the subject. The Catholic Inquisition soon publishes what may be the most blood-soaked book in human history. The Malaeus Maleficarum. The Witch's Hammer. It instructed the clergy on how to locate, torture, and kill all free-thinking women. 
In three centuries of witch hunts, 50,000 women are captured, burned alive at the stake. Oh, at least that. Some say millions. The other thing Matilda Jocelyn Gage was responsible for was repeating an earlier estimate that 9 million people were killed in the witch hunts. This is a wild overestimate and of course while we're never going to know how many people were really killed, most scholars agree this is probably somewhere around 50,000. Um, however, somebody called Gottfried Christian Voigt, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, in the 1790s calculated this 9 million number in a ridiculous way which I will put a link to and this was repeated by other scholars until feminist writers are suddenly able to turn this 9 million people into 9 million women which is what leads me to my next point. The victims were not just women and the accusers were not just men. So the second part of the narrative, which is just not true, is that this was a campaign by men against women. This ignores two really key aspects of what was going on. Firstly, that the gender split of the accused is actually more like 70-30. Um, of course, the exact um, ratio is debated. However, Steven Pinker looks at this in The Better Angels of Our Nature and he comes up with this 70-30 split and there is certainly plenty of evidence that many of the accused were male. So we just can't say this was um, an action that was totally taken against women. Um, secondly, the accusers were also more likely to be female than male. Um, and the Better Angels of Our Nature is actually a really good place to look for insight on why this may have been. In the introduction, Pinker talks about how violence is usually much more likely to be male and male. So the phenomenon of witch trials is interesting to look at because it's a rare case where it's a form of violence that is more likely to be female on female. Um, and interestingly, the other is that while most murders are male on male, cases of abortion and infanticide have historically been more likely to be female on female. Um, I'm not making any uh, comment on that, I just think it's, it's interesting. Um, Yet, particularly for witch hunts, we now seem to have developed this narrative that it's a form of male oppression of women. Again, particularly in the case of the Salem witch trials, even though more men did become involved and things escalated the way that they did because of that, things do seem to have kicked off because of things going on between women. And the majority of the accusers did remain female. Um, Again, part of the stereotype was that this was about getting intelligent women, healers, midwives. The majority of the accused in Salem did not fall under this category. They were much more likely to be low class and maybe have a disagreeable disposition rather than people who were sort of considered wise. And actually, sometimes the accusers were more likely to fit the profile of how we would stereotypically uh, view some of the victims. Um, and of course, I'm not at all saying that there was no prejudice at all against women at that time, which you do sometimes see in the court documents, but you certainly cannot look at all the evidence and say that male desire to oppress and control women was a primary driving force. Um, of course, there were aspects of the lives of women in that time and place, which almost certainly did contribute uh, to what happened, which I'll talk about later, but this Da Vinci Code idea of an active campaign against wise women is an absolute fiction. Okay, so now that my main point about how the feminist narrative is total garbage is over, if you were only interested in the facts, you can just stop listening now. However, one of the many reasons this video has taken me so long to make is because the more I read about the Salem witch trials in particular, I just can't help seeing parallels on so many levels with the culture war we're living through. Um, so I just want to issue a disclaimer that most of what I'm going to say is only based on this one book that I've read because it contains a lot of the facts and the actual um, primary sources. However, this is not a dissertation. I haven't read every single source that's out there. This is just the ramblings of a mum who spends most of her time looking after two children under the age of five. Um, I also just want to say that, of course, you know, I have my own confirmation bias and everything I'm going to talk about is just a theory. It's just ideas. And of course, 
it is not a perfect analogy. None of the, the analogies I'm about to make are a perfect analogies for anything. Um, you know, McCarthyism, witch trials, cancel culture, yes, there are some similarities, but they're fundamentally different things as well. However, the comparison that I do want to make and that really is there is that these are clearly behaviours that we all have the potential for. And yes, a lot of what I'm about to talk about represents the worst of humanity, but these situations also bring out the best of humanity. We see so many examples of bravery, what husbands do for their wives, what children do for their parents, what granddaughters do for their grandfathers, the people who refused to confess and gave their lives because they refused to be cowards. And that's what this story shows us. It shows us how you make things like this stop and you make things like this stop with bravery. Um, and of course, the other point to make is, of course, the stakes are obviously just not comparable. We are very lucky about the fact that we're not going to be executed for having the wrong opinions, but there have been some suicides over Me Too style allegations, for example, and thanks to hate speech legislation, we are heading in a direction of the enforcement of ideological purity. So it is really important to think about how, yes, these are all normal human behaviours and will always occur to some extent, but it's about times where they get really exaggerated and those are the times when these kind of tragedies happen and lives are lost. I really think it is true that all humans have the potential to do this. I think all human societies have the potential to end up in a place where all someone has to do is point a finger at someone, call them a name and have that be enough to destroy them. Um, it obviously happened in Nazi Germany, it happened in the Cultural Revolution, it happened in the French Revolution, you could just accuse any person at any time of being an aristocrat, it obviously happened in the McCarthyist era, and I also remember watching a documentary uh, a few years ago, if anyone recognises what I'm describing, please, please send me a message about it, because I searched and searched, um, for this documentary and I couldn't find it. It was uh, filmed in Africa, I don't remember which country, um, and this film crew had actually visited this country 25 years ago and filmed this rural community and maybe five or six years ago they returned there to see how this community was doing um, and they hadn't been doing very well um, and one a uh, family who had been the main family they'd followed had lost their father and had really fallen on much harder times and actually the daughter of this family had just lost her own baby and it was absolutely heartbreaking and um, it showed the burial of this baby um, and everyone is, is just clearly so upset and this this poor woman she was only maybe in her early 20s um, and and the father's family they were sitting there arguing with each other and because this child had just been lost, and actually the reason they lost this child was because they had been given medication to, to give the child, but had refused it for some reason, they, they didn't trust it somehow. Um, and you could see these families getting so angry and upset with each other and with themselves. Suddenly they start hurling these accusations of witch. You caused this child's death because you're a witch. And this is in, I mean, maybe 2012, 2013, it was a BBC documentary. If anyone recalls having watched it, please send me a message. I would be desperate to watch it again uh, so that I can link it. And of course, this brings me to the fact that there are many places in the world where accusations of witchcraft are a huge problem today. Uh, for example, in the DRC, often there are people who accuse children of being witches or of being possessed by evil spirits so they can force their families to pay their savings, uh, for them to exercise the child, often very violently. Sometimes people are accused just because people don't want to share the food with them or the money with them. Sometimes children who've been accused of witchcraft are abandoned on the streets, treated violently or even killed. Um, I have added some videos about this topic which frankly are just so harrowing. I've watched them years ago. Now that I'm a parent, I actually can't bear to watch them again. Um, I have also included a link to a charity to which I've made a small donation, which works on this among other things. Um, 
During the Salem witch trials, a four and a half year old girl was chained up in a dungeon for months and months. And when I was reading about this as a parent, I just found this so upsetting and harrowing. And obviously we cannot help her, but there are children suffering from this today who we can help. So if you are able to, or if you want to, please think about making a donation to the charity. I will make sure it's the first link down below. I think part of the reason this happens in all cultures and it has happened at all times is because it has a lot to do with immaturity and I think there are always going to be immature people out there. This sort of thing tends to often kick off among children. It kicked off among children and young people in Salem. There's also a case uh, from Great Britain called the Pennell case which was a child who was living in a home I think with a parent and a step parent and half brothers and sisters who was clearly very sort of angry and there were lots of tensions in the home. And I think, you know, usually when children are behaving in an immature way and they can often be spiteful and things can get quite ugly, there is supposed to be somebody there who is the adult and who can stop things from escalating. If anyone's read Lord of the Flies, uh, William Golding, one of the reasons he wrote that was because he was a teacher in, uh, I think, a boys' school. And he actually says so many times he witnessed these scenarios where something really, really ugly was, was going to happen. And he said... If only I hadn't been there to stop it, dear God, something terrible would have happened. And I think Lord of the Flies is very much him saying, well, what if? What if there aren't any grown-ups there? Um, this is how ugly things can really get. Um, and I think one of the things that really characterises these situations that get out of control is when the adults who do have power over a situation are actually really immature themselves or irresponsible themselves in some way and actually once you start looking at the adult characters who were around in Salem in 1692 that really was the case and I don't know maybe there's a comparison to be drawn there between the millennials who are my generation now being in these positions of power and responsibility in places like universities and mainstream media outlets. Um, I want to try not to talk about Evergreen College too much because Every time I watch a video about Evergreen College, um, I just want to kind of make comparisons with every single thing uh, that, that's being shown. Um, somebody called Benjamin A. Boyce is making these videos. I will put a link to his channel. Uh, it should be absolutely required viewing. It's pretty scary. Um, so the president of this college is somebody called George S. Bridges, and he is so clearly encouraging everything that's going on there and really using it uh, because he has an ideological objective. Um, these students at this college, I don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but they have basically been given a license to do whatever they want, start running the show, and my goodness, they are really doing that. And there is some very special behavior that can be observed. So how did the lunatics start running the asylum in Salem? Things seem to have kicked off in the home of the Reverend, who was a man called Reverend Paris, who seems to have had a very fragile ego. He'd had several kind of failures in his past and he just seems to be very brittle and constantly worried about what other people think of him, which is uh, not a good recipe. He seems to have had a wife that was unwell. Um, he had several children, one of whom was a daughter named Betty Paris, who's the one that we hear about uh, in the story of what happened. And Ab Abigail Williams, um, who is the person that Arthur Miller writes about, was also a girl, probably an orphan, that was in his household because uh, he probably ended up having to look after her. In this household, there were also two slaves called Tituba and John Indian. They were actually slaves taken from the Caribbean um, and their surname was given as Indian because that's how they would have referred to Caribbeans at that time. We don't quite know how the strange behaviour of the girls started. It's probably down to the fact that they were maybe doing something superstitious that they should not have been doing. Betty, much later after the events that happened, confessed that they had been cracking eggs into glasses of water to see how the egg yolk somehow flowed and somehow that would um, reveal their future. Um, but the first everybody seems to have known about it was when Abigail and Betty started behaving strangely. They were sort of climbing into holes and hiding under chairs. Um, and then as things went 
on, the behaviour kind of got more and more hysterical. And then some other girls started joining in with this behaviour. And what does Reverend Paris do? He actually becomes hysterical himself. Um, and he starts pointing the finger at neighbours who have then suggested that uh, Tichiba and John try another kind of superstitious trick to see what was going on with the girls. And he preaches an absolutely hysterical and terrified uh, sermon at his neighbour because he needs to deflect. And I think something that Arthur Miller gets absolutely spot on in The Crucible, obviously he makes up certain you know details of the circumstances but I think he's really really spot on with how everything escalates from people trying to deflect the children can't be honest about the naughty thing that they've done with the adults and then in turn the adults are so terrified that they are going to look bad that what the adults need to do is then deflect that onto other members of the community and those two ingredients together make a recipe for some really, really serious accusations and also for hysteria because actually what a responsible adult is supposed to be able to do with a young person is to contain their emotion and to allow them to confess the truth so that they can sort of deal with it and move on and learn how to act the next time instead of push everything down and just try and hold on to being right at all costs. We do know quite a bit about hysteria, it is a real thing. I will actually put some links below to some cases that have happened recently in uh, a very religious part of Malaysia where there have been outbreaks of mass hysteria in schools, but it's also happened certainly in British boarding schools. It happened to soldiers who were traumatised in the First World War. If you've read the Regeneration, Regeneration Trilogy by Pat Barker, she talks a lot about these symptoms and the symptoms are very, very similar to some of what was going on in Salem uh, during the witch hunts and it's almost certain that there was a genuine outbreak of hysteria. It is more likely to affect females than males and at that time it does seem like males maybe did have more opportunities to do things outside such as military service. It does seem like they probably did have more outlets uh, than some of the girls did even though the group of afflicted or accusers, whatever you want to call them, were joined by males. However, this was a society where everybody was pretty repressed. There were no theatres, there were very few opportunities for having any kind of entertainment, it was considered sinful. So suddenly you have these hysterical girls, which becomes a form of entertainment. They did not believe in hiding this away. So suddenly they were on display, everyone was coming to visit, other girls started realising all the attention they were getting and they started joining in. At this point where everything starts snowballing, yes, Reverend Paris is desperately trying to get Tituba to confess to having started all the witchcraft. However, his kind of ally, somebody called Thomas Putnam, who is a member of a very sort of senior family in Salem Village and who is closely allied to Paris because they had wanted him to become the pastor, is also getting involved and because these two are such close allies this kind of is reflecting badly on the Putnams as well having the Reverend's family who they had supported kind of be bewitched but I think it's probably also the moment when things stop being about what's going on with these girls and start being about the adults because suddenly I think maybe all the adults realise hang on a minute, if somebody's going to be accused of witchcraft, maybe it can be somebody outside of our sort of faction, outside of our unit, maybe we could start to use this to our advantage. And this is the moment where things probably start to become a bit more political and a bit more contrived. And again, at the very beginning of the witch trials, we can see from the sort of depositions that people signed against the accused witches, they, which were signed by several people, many of them, most of them adults, um, people across these factional lines within the village were signing these depositions. So it seems like people genuinely were scared. 
um, and people genuinely did think that there was, you know, witchcraft afoot. So at some point, relatively near the beginning of everything, Thomas Putnam's wife and daughter, who are both called Anne, plus an orphan girl who's living in his house, whose name is Mercy Lewis, all started having these fits as well, and they would go on to become part of this group of accusers, and these people would go on to accuse the enemies of the Putnams, and I'll sort of discuss the village politics a bit more later, and Anne Jr. in particular would sort of lead the accusers in these really, really sort of violent fits that um, actually convinced everyone in, in the court and in the society to convict these individuals, certain individuals, who were actually the Putnam's main enemies or main targets. So what is very clear here is, is that this hysteria started off personal, it started off because of something small going on, but it very, very quickly became politically expedient. And I think it really shows what happens when you have immature people with grudges and chips on their shoulder who suddenly realise that they have ended up with a weapon in their hands. And I think we have been seeing an awful lot of that over the past few years. Later on, I'm going to talk about the Gregory Ann and Elliot case where somebody with a grudge was able to bring a harassment claim and generate a huge circus over basically nothing. Um, I think... Arthur Miller actually does a really good job of distilling the different motivations and personality types that were at play here. You've got Paris's desperate need to prove his worth, coupled with his fear and his self-delusion, which makes him behave in the way that he does. And then you've got the Putnams, uh, you know, where, where Anne Putnam Sr. really believes in the witchcraft and then her husband Thomas, who sees the political application of these accusations, and Arthur Miller really shows how together these personality types are dangerous. You've got the political agenda, plus the useful idiots, or if you want to call them the hysterical useful idiots. Stop it! Oh, yeah. oh we should stop. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. So why is this happening now? Why are some of these very privileged, very well-educated young people kind of going crazy about problems that are really almost invisible or arguably aren't really even problems at all in the way that they seem to exaggerate them to be? Is it something to do with the internet? I don't know. Maybe... Whereas maybe in Salem, in the time of the witch trials, there were basically no outlets for young people to do anything. I wonder, maybe, are there too many choices for young people today? Do we have too many outlets and possibilities? Is there sort of too much pressure to achieve something with the kind of fabulous education that a lot of these young people at universities are having, who seem to sometimes be the ones who are most fraught and most hysterical? Whatever it is that you... Are interested in nowadays or that you want to achieve you can probably guarantee that there will be a 14 year old on YouTube doing it better than you and getting millions and millions of, of hits because of it so I don't know is it this feeling of hang on a minute if this person's made it on Instagram or YouTube or wherever well why haven't I made it um Maybe it's just easier for them if, if they realise that they have this weapon, if they have this ability to make an accusation of racism or sexism or harassment and suddenly get a huge amount of attention and also power. I mean, particularly if you look at the example of what's happening in Evergreen College, these undergraduates who are very, very young and have, in some cases have hardly really even started their degrees can basically find themselves in a position where they're sort of running their own college and taking control of everything. Maybe that amount of power is just too intoxicating, or or maybe it's just because more broadly everyone, you know, is now on the internet and it is just so much easier to get the messages out there and people who subscribe to this particular um, philosophy, this particular ideology, have just been very, very good at getting their message out there or maybe it's just down to the fact that because we now have the internet you know that there will always be this mob there to support you 
even if you're found to be lying or wrong. Um, if you think about, for example, the Gameshi trial, those accusers were absolutely found to have lied and colluded, but the whole community was still there to protect them, to defend them, to support them. And maybe it's this fact that there is just this tribe that has a belief system that they cannot deviate from in any way, otherwise everything around them, their whole framework for viewing the universe and humanity just collapses. So uh, this brings me to my next point, which is just going to be um, about the Puritan belief system and this particular society at this time in New England. So what was this Puritan belief system? Uh, they did not call themselves Puritans, they sort of called themselves the godly, uh, the saints, God's children. The term Puritan was actually pejorative, it's a bit like the term SJW today, but the term has stuck because it was kind of accurate. It was sort of really an extreme form of Protestantism, which, you know, in many ways was a good idea and wanted to get rid of a lot of unhelpful practices from Europe's Middle Ages under the Catholic Church. However, Puritans believed that the Reformation had not gone far enough, and so some of them decided to travel to the New World to set up this society. Most of them went in the 1530s, which is 60 years before the Salem Witch Trials, so we're talking about sort of two generations later. Um, but these people who had founded this society and, and who, you know, were, were carrying it on, these were people who had taken a, an idea that was not a bad idea, but they're taking this idea as far as it can possibly go. And there is no idea that is so good it is not going to turn bad when you push it so far, whatever it is. Healthy eating or exercising or trying to never offend someone or feminism. If you decide to be obsessed by an idea so much that you live it every single second of every single day, you know, once you've moved that far to one extreme, some, you know, if you've become a communist, you know, suddenly everything to the other side of you is going to look like fascism. Um, if, if you're familiar in the UK with the Labour Party, think about the Labour Party conference. It's just this echo chamber that goes further and further to the left. Um, and they, they kind of get to a stage where most normal people are just incredulous at some of the decisions that they've made. Um, but, you know, when, when you keep going further and further towards an extreme, it is going to create scepticism because you've got nowhere else to go once you've gone that far towards an extreme. But by the time people start pushing back, people like this just aren't able to deal with scepticism in a rational way because they just can't conceive of any other way of viewing the world. So is there a comparison to be made between the argument about ideas that was being had when the world was coming out of the Middle Ages and going through the Renaissance um, to the, the battle of ideas that's happening now that we're sort of trying to figure out what to believe in and what our, objecti our objectives should be as a society? Um, and I think in both times there was this real sense of those who did have an ideology and who did believe they had the answers, wanting everybody to be singing from the same hymn sheet and getting very, very upset when everybody won't jump on board their train and come along on their journey uh, to make the world a perfect place. So, of course, you've got, you know, Catholics and Protestants burning each other. Um, and, you know, in the modern day, we've got people, you know, desperately trying to convince everyone that the only way to make the world a better place is to subscribe to their ideology. I remember way back, probably in 2013, um, somebody that I actually know um, who is sort of a, a professional um, women's advocate uh, had this this um, picture on her Facebook and she, she'd she been at a conference and the, the title of this um, panel that she was on was literally how to spread feminism using social media. You know, it wasn't about making things better for women. It was purely about just getting this idea out to everyone. Um, and I think, you know, maybe when when such terrible things are happening in the world, as, as they have always been, maybe we're just afraid that the world is just controlled by cruel fate. So if we can, you know, pick out an evil person or one very specific evil thing that is being done and stamp that out or stamp out that one person, that one sexist person, that one misogynist person, that one person who's a witch. Maybe if we can just iron out that tiny 
wrinkle in our really quite comfortable society, maybe we can make the world perfect. And I think this is why these ideologues freak out over the tiniest of things, like how a man sits on the train, even though there are tremendous and terrifying evils out there. Um, maybe this is something that is just so much easier to deal with. Um, and I think another important comparison between um, sort of the Puritan society and some of the social justice movements we have today is this idea that membership of the church actually came from a conversion narrative. So people would describe spiritual experiences where, you know, the, the speaker had been granted God's grace. Um, and this kind of sounds a lot like the sort of lived experience microaggression narrative where it almost gives you a badge of honour or authority and puts you in a position where you have the power to speak if you have some kind of story whereby you have experienced some kind of you know oppression or microaggression and I think it's the these are the ingredients that make people who have this kind of faith and this kind of belief system so likely to explode when they're contradicted, they just can't cope. You know, Jordan Peterson talks about how people, you, humans really do need something to believe in. Um, but, you know, within that belief system, there's kind of got to be a balance between the order and the chaos. If you believe in something that's too structured and too ordered, you, you know, get something like what happened in Salem in 1692. However, if there's too much chaos, that also does not end well. Funnily enough, the um, Latin motto of Evergreen College literally translates to let it all hang out. And if you go and watch uh, some of the videos about what has gone on at Evergreen College, letting it all hang out too much is also not good. Many people have, of course, discussed the religious nature of intersexual social justice movements and how they make people behave. And I think um, one thing they have in common with the Puritan belief system is this dichotomy of good and evil. So maybe it's not good and evil anymore. Maybe it's the patriarchy or misogyny or sexism, you know, versus whoever the oppressed party is. Um, both these groups, they see everything. They see all interactions in those terms. And so... All the accusations of things like this are conveniently unfalsifiable because remember, original sin or the devil or whatever, and also white male privilege are, you know, very conveniently invisible. We can't see them, they can never be proved, yet we have to constantly be battling them, or at least that's what's expected of people under these ideologies. Um, you know, the Puritans may have had their religious texts, but, you know, the social justice brigade have their critical theory and both of these were designed to be purposefully opaque. The grievance studies hoaxes go into this in detail, I will put a link to some of their stuff below um, and also you can uh, look at the Quillette article that I mentioned before, I'll link to that as well, um, where this um, reformed SJW academic basically says, nah, I just made it all up, I did some research which was kind of good but I just sandwiched it with all this kind of critical theory which nobody's really supposed to understand and which you know may or may not be correct. Once you have a belief system that works in this black and white way and doesn't admit any other interpretation of how the world works, so for example this idea that every human interaction is governed by power and oppression dynamics or governed by a battle between God and the devil, um, you need to fit everything into that system. Um, so, you know, if you believe that misogyny and sexism are everywhere and explain every interaction between men and women, you are then going to sort of change your vocabulary to sort of, you know, alter people's perceptions of reality. So um, when women are bad to women, it's called internalised misogyny. When men are bad to other men, it's called secondary misogyny. You know, you have to make the world fit into, you know, you have to make everything in the world fit into your system. And something that Karen Strawn talks about is how, you know, many people propose the germ theory of disease spread, um, but nobody accepted it, even though it was correct, because they could only think in terms of the miasma theory. They weren't ready to fit something like that into a framework where it just kind of, you know, didn't fit. 
the Puritans believed that the devil was everywhere, so they had to magic him up to explain anything bad that happened to them. And I think, you know, this is part of the reason why there are so many scandals about feminist men. People who hold themselves to impossible standards end up living in a state of constant paranoia. And I think all the dirt is really sort of in their own minds. So they end up sort of having to project it onto others or those that are in their midst. And, you know, because of their ideological thinking, they really can't see any way out of the problem than sort of adding more of the same ideology. They think that the solution to the problems caused by the religion is more religion. You know, feminists will always say that more feminism is the solution to any of the problems that they are contributing to the cause of, especially for boys. And, you know, the Puritans would order fasting and prayer and expect this to end the the fits that were happening to these girls because they thought they were being punished for something wicked that they had done um when in actual fact somewhere on a much deeper level they did know the reverend paris actually sent his daughter betty away before the trial started happening and slowly slowly the fits stopped when she was separated from the other girls and she got better the other thing it is really important to understand is that the puritan faith actually kind of didn't make sense. It was based on this idea that God already knew who would be saved and who would be the saints. Um, however, you still had to kind of go around always worried that you would somehow succumb to the devil. Um, so it's argued that this resulted in a kind of mix between smugness because of this knowledge that, you know, they believe that their faith and their God was the true God and they were the only ones that had the true way to heaven, but also of fear because, of course, there was always this threat of damnation, but I think there must always have been this kind of insecurity about, ah, uh, what if it's not our God? What if it's, I don't know, a different God? What if we're wrong? That must have always been at the back of their minds. Um, and again, I think a lot of the intersectional social justice arguments also don't make sense. There are so many circular arguments, there are so many denials of inconvenient facts. Um, you know, to think about how anti-science they can sound sometimes, think about how they tie themselves in knots with things like, you know, top uh, issues like sex work, the trans debate. Well, if there's such a thing as a male brain and a female brain, then you can transition to be the other gender. But if there isn't such a thing as a male brain or a female brain, which is kind of what we believe as, as well, then how does that work? And I think they tie themselves in so many knots over that. They just are so afraid of being wrong that they have to silence their critic. In addition to having to live with the insecurity of their belief system being nonsensical, the people of Salem in the 1690s also had to deal with the fact that their Puritan nirvana had failed. This was two generations later after they had, you know, gone and stolen other people's land and they'd been living pretty miserable lives still, you know, under the threat of being killed by indigenous Americans every day, it was very painful to see what was happening at that time in the rest of the world. And what was happening was the world was moving on towards science and commercialism and individualism, which interestingly are all things that the modern social justice left have a problem with today. Um, the world was going that way without them. And they must have felt very anxious. And I think the witch hunts came out of their anger at, you know, trying to prove something. There was a faction in the village led by the Putnams that seems to have been dealing with this decline by holding even more tightly to this faith. And what they had been trying to do for several years was to establish their own official church as a separate entity to the Church of Salem Town. Um, and what's important to remember is that Salem Village was a backwater. It came into existence because Salem Town had needed food. And the whole factional split in the village was caused by the Putnams wanting their own inward-looking church so that they could keep sway over this tiny little universe. And the other faction of mostly farmers wanting to maintain their commercial ties with Salem Town and sort of be more of a part of the world outside that was moving on. 
at this time, senior clerics were actually writing texts to encourage belief in the paranormal. Francis Hill describes one of these, which is called An Essay for the Recording of Illustrious Provinces. And she talks about how its publication was a move calculated to encourage belief in things supernatural among the ordinary people. And that personally reminds me of a lot of feminist writers, particularly Naomi Wolf, who sort of twists everything to make sure that women feel threatened at all times, no matter how much cherry picking she has to do. And of course, people need to do this for their careers, but they also need to do it to feel relevant. And I think that is what was going on in the 17th century as well. Um, this tiny little Salem village maybe was a little bit like, you know, modern universities where perhaps undergraduates feel like they need to make themselves the centre of the universe because they kind of can't handle their own insignificance. I think people in Salem in 1692 really wanted to believe that the battle between good and evil was being fought right there in New England, just like maybe in American colleges, which are probably the most liberal safe spaces that have ever existed on this planet, you often hear them described as places where women and minorities are literally in grave danger every single moment they spend there. And remember, the senior judges and the clerics who were running these courtrooms had an agenda of promoting superstition, just like the leaders of some of the universities where we see all of this craziness happening the most are also ideologues. And I think we have to remember that ideological people put their agenda before their job, whether that is running a courtroom, a news outlet, a university or a school. It is also probably no coincidence that this happened when the charter granting the New England colony the right to rule itself had actually been revoked. At that moment, there was technically no legal system and everything was in limbo. This actually did save lives because in 1692, a senior cleric called Increase Mather was actually in London negotiating a new charter. So at the time, the the witch accusations kicked off. No trials could legally take place. So all these um, initial hearings that took place had no legal status. They were just hearings. So if you know the play The Crucible, this is why the characters spend such a long time in prison after they've sort of been heard and there are all those scenes that feel like they're in a courtroom. So much time has gone by before the executions actually take place. So what happened in 1692 was that there were all these initial hearings. Many people were left to rot in jail and then also many, many more people were also accused. However, quite a significant period um, elapsed of a few months and it's likely that if this had not happened, they probably would have killed a lot more people. Francis Hill describes that the effect of this loss of legal status was that the self-respect of a society was destroyed and it was stripped of social identity and moral authority, end quote. Maybe this is part of the reason why they became the very things they wanted to destroy. Maybe they hated themselves because they couldn't find the battle between God and the devil anywhere, so they manifested it and, of course, they ended up projecting it onto the people closest to them. And maybe this is why, despite the fact that we live in a time when women have never had more rights or opportunities, we have things like this. Femme Farrow is a queer femme fighting force. We want to destroy the conservative government. We want to bring down the patriarchy. We want to take up space. We want to make lots of noise. We're really angry about the way that women and kind of femme-identifying people were being treated around things like Brexit and this conservative government and having nowhere to put that anger. We fight each other as a mode of resistance to try and channel our energies and our rage. In a movement that is supposed to be all about the empowerment of women and wanting women to reach the top because they believe angry men are trying to keep them down. At the end of the clip I just played you, if you have a look at the link, these women end up calling for the death of the woman who at the time was Prime Minister. There's lots of swearing, which is why I have chosen not to play it to you, and my rule for myself is that I never want to make a video that I wouldn't want my children to watch, but I do advise that you go and have a look at it. And of course, I think it's fantastic that they have the right to do that. However, 
I think the fact that they are given attention for behaving like this and for speaking in that way about a woman is a sign of their absolute privilege. And I think it's also a sign of how people get into this state and end up completely getting reality backwards. The afflicted uh, accusers in Salem, they were claiming that people were hurting them. They were claiming that people were sending out their spirit to come and do harm to them. But the reality was that they were trying to hurt others. They were trying to have them arrested and punished and executed. And of course, these children kept being referred to as children, even though they were joined by many adults, they were joined by men, they were supported by adults, they were given a huge amount of power. But they were not children, they were not innocent, they were the ones trying to cause harm. 